it's a 100% emotional game for me. So I read all this self-help bullshit. I meditate every morning, I exercise, uh, I do all these vitamins. It's pretty much only to do one thing. I spend most all of my energy outside of like doing the actual work. I'm making sure that I can keep my mood calm. You really gotta care about this thing because internet people have the greatest bullshit detector there is. And what's the best way to circumvent someone's bullshit detector? You don't bullshit. That's the best way. Look, if you have a machine that turns $1 into $2, what do you do? You load up a dump truck with as much money as you possibly can and you just back it into that machine. I had that machine and I was still very conservative with how I was spending. And I think that really hurt me and I was doing it from a place of scarcity mindset and from like, there's no way this is, like I had a lot of self doubt, like there's no way this is gonna work. No way. And now looking back, and I also invest in a lot of companies now, I like see, I'm seeing patterns, I'm like, I should have defaulted to optimism the whole time because it was working. Uh, so. All right, what's going on? This is my first time. You're gonna hear everyone say this. It's my first time doing this in, in years. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and what we do, but I'll tell you a, a, a cool story first. But the summary is my company is called The Hustle. Does anyone read The Hustle? Cool, so we have some uh, users here. So. It's a, it's a daily email that goes out to millions of people and we give you the business news and information you need to know. That's a very simple version. I'll talk more about what, it, what that actually means. But our first week of business, we almost went out of business. And so basically my company, it's a media company, we started as a conference, a little bit like this. And the way that we would get speakers, I didn't have any money, the way, but the way we would get speakers, I couldn't buy ads. Uh, sorry, not speakers, t uh, attendees. We would, uh, I couldn't buy ads, so I didn't have any money, and so I started blogging about the speakers, and one thing led to another, and it was incredibly profitable, and it, and it made a lot of money. But I didn't want to only do conferences, and so I had read the biography of Ted Turner, of uh, the Murdoch family, of the Hearst family, and I was like, sick. I'm launching a media company. I'm going to be a media guy. I didn't really know what that meant, but that's what I was going to do. And so I launched this post saying, I've got $500,000, I'm building this media company from the hustle, watch us blow all the money to make it happen. And I had like this picture of me where like my eyes weren't even open and I was like, kind of looked like a smug jackass, but I was like, that's cool, that's the angle I'm gonna go with. <laughs> I don't think I'm entirely that, but I was like, it's gonna get clicks, it's, the story's cool, like we're gonna be obnoxious, it's kind of douchey, but it's awesome. And so we launched this and then the next week, I'm like, all right, what am I gonna write? And I had remembered this story about this guy that I knew and he was making $60,000 a month selling books on Kindle, basically about teaching guys how to uh, meet and pick up women. And I was like, dude, you don't know anything about this. I've never seen you with a woman. He's like, yeah, but I just find top selling books and I send them to the Philippines, they rewrite them. So they get past the Kindle like plagiarism thing and they go live and I pay $5 to get a sexy looking title and I headline it and then I pay people to review it and it goes to the top of the charts and it's a recurring cycle. Then I put best selling author on my LinkedIn and I get paid more money doing that. I'm like, oh my God, that is very shady and kind of a really cool story. And so my first blog post, like we wrote about that and then I'm like, all right, we gotta come out with a bang. We gotta come out hard here. So let's just copy what he said and become a best selling author. And we weren't gonna do it in the, like the sex women or the picking up women type of space because we found out when we were doing research that romance novels, does anyone here read romance novels? You can admit it. Yeah, I didn't think it, that many people. So I didn't read it, I didn't know much about it, but I researched it. It basically has some of the largest liquidity in the Amazon marketplace. So basically uh, loads of new titles constantly and people eat this up. They love buying it and um, they read it. And so we decided to launch a romance novel uh, and like we did, we like did research and there's like categories of like people who want to have sex with vampires, people want to have sex with people in the military. And so we made a joke. We're going to make like, it's a, it's a werewolf who's in the military. And, uh, and, um, so we find a book that like was doing really well. I got a guy off, off Fiverr to make a different title and a different headline for that. And then we kind of skipped over the whole getting someone to rewrite it because we only had a few days to get this live and so we kind of rewrote it, we submitted it, we paid people to upvote it, boom, it got to the top of its category. We made a joke and we put LinkedIn best-selling author in our category, you know, the whole joke uh, was like, yeah, we're a best-selling author, you should pay us to consult with you. And, uh, but the point was is that like this methodology we think is not right and it's kind of shady, but we did it in like a funny way. And so we launched this post on like a Tuesday and immediately all the bloggers in the romance novel category 
which there's a lot of them, they got super pissed at us. They thought we were making fun of them. We weren't making fun of them at all. We just happened to pick that category and uh, they were livid and they shared it like crazy. It got to the top of tons of different subreddits. It got to the top of the self-publishing subreddit. Self-publishing blogs were writing about it. It was, a, it was a hit right away. And I get all these emails and Twitter messages and Facebook messages, oh, this is so funny, or oh, I hate you, you're such a douche, like just all types of stuff. And I'm loving it. And then I get this email and it says in the subject line, cease and desist. And it's from a URL, I, don't, I didn't recognize who this company was. And it like this really like crazy email that said something like, um, the book that you are used to copy, that the author reached out to us, we own that, we're the publisher of that, and we're gonna pursue this as hard as we can. We're gonna make an example out of you. And in my head I was like, shit. <laughs> like, this was like the same day, like I was, like, was, I was crushing it, and then I was like, we're gonna go out of business the very first like three days that we launched. And it was, the URL was Harlequin. Has anyone heard of Harlequin books? <laughs> I didn't know what that was. Harlequin, I had no idea. Harlequin is a massive publisher, probably, I don't know exactly how big they are, but thousands of employees, the largest publisher of romance novels in the country. The author, and she was right to do this, was causing a fuss about this online. And uh, so I get on the phone with this lawyer, and I'm like, and I was, uh, I was, I was scared. I was like, I get scared just thinking about it. I was nervous. I was like, oh, this guy's gonna sue me. We're screwed. I just had this douchey post where I wrote about how I've got $500,000 to start this business and I look like an idiot on this picture. I'm like this blonde white bro who's got his eyes closed. Like I'm the opposite of what these people like stand for. I'm the total opposite. What am I doing? And I get on the phone and I'm like, look man, my point wasn't to insult you. It just, that just happened to be the category I chose. And he goes, yeah, look, that was an overly stern email. I was just trying to scare you. I understand what you're trying to do. Can you please just like put a comment at the bottom that says, you know, we, we talked to Harley Quinn. We removed the book from the actual Amazon page. And we'll calm down the author and just like say you're sorry to her. And I was like, oh my God, thank God. It was like, it was like a, a miracle. So we got away with it. But then, uh, like basically, I realized there was a few things about this business and I'm, I'll talk all about it, but basically the first is if I'm going to continue doing this, which I am, don't look as douchey as I was. And it's not wrong to be authentic and like do that type of stuff, but like that wasn't even me and I was just like playing this part in order to get uh, attention and I totally just suffered the consequences. The second is that the type of content that we were going to write about, we were going to be very authentic. We were going to write like we speak, and sometimes that's going to piss people off, but that's okay. Uh, in my head, I was like, big companies won't do this because they got to go through 10 different committees. This is just me. At the time, it was just me. There is no committee. I can do whatever I want, and I should do whatever I want because that's going to help me stick out. Um, and so basically, I was like, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm not going to be a mercenary. Like, I'm not a hired gun here. I'm going to live this shit. And then the third thing was, this, these ideas that I have of this style of content marketing, I'm going to talk all about what that style is. It works. So that week, so I just bought the URL, the hustle.co. So we had no backlinks. We had zero traffic. That week, we got like half a million people to our website. And the premise behind our business is we're a daily email. So we reach about 2 million people a day and we make money through a variety of ways. One big ways is we have ads in the email, native ads that we, we went and sold and we make the ads. And so we had to get those emails in the first place. Once you get them, then you can build a huge business. You gotta get them first. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, and so I was like, I'm gonna get all these emails via content marketing. And so the third takeaway from this was like, this works. I'm gonna continue doing this. And we actually still do it. So the, uh, my company, The Hustle, we, um, we do this still every single Sunday. So that post, that Kindle post, that's been read millions of times, but that's not even our most popular, We're close to it now. So we still do this. So we've launched hundreds and hundreds of these style of posts. Not always, but often they do really, really well and they, get, they go viral. But that week when we launched, we, I didn't have an email list. And by the end of the week, I had 10,000 subscribers. And we actually did this methodology for the first year or so where I just, I was blogging like a madman. I would do sometimes five posts a day and we got about, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere around 150,000 to 200,000 email subscribers in the first year without a cent spent on ads. And that strategy still works, by the way. Um, and so 
uh, we still do it. And so my company is called The Hustle. So what we do is we have this daily email that goes out to about 2 million people. It has a crazy high open rate, so something like 45% unique open rate every single day. Um, we also own this thing called Trends, so trends.co. So with The Hustle, we make money through ads. We just sold the company, and I'll tell you about that as well, but um, had we not sold this year, we would have scared, and then this would be our fourth or fifth, I think this will be our fourth full year of business. We would have done about $20 million in sales, um, and advertising would have been an eight-figure business. We didn't have, uh, so we make money through ads and email. We didn't have our conference this year. We typically host conferences, but we'll have tens of thousands of people. So that doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, or, but it, it, it would have event one day. That would have made millions, but not this year, but maybe next year. But uh, we also own Trends, so this thing called Trends.co. And I could talk all about that, but that's a subscription business and a paid community, a little bit like this. And we have a team of researchers and analysts, and all we do is scour the web, and we have lots of proprietary data, and we try to look at really uh, fast-growing trends and explain why they're gonna be popular and uh, uh, how you can capitalize on them. The company, though, uh, and this actually would relate to a bunch of people here, so uh, does anyone use HubSpot? Some people use HubSpot. So they reached out to us last October and they were like, look, we, we want to be the, one of the first people to build this, this software business that has a media component to it. And so we closed that deal and they bought us in uh, January. And so uh, that deal closed late January. So I sold the company and, and it was for tens of millions of dollars. We, we didn't really raise any VC. I, I owned most of the company, so it was a good outcome for me. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, but we, we still do the, the stuff that we started doing. We did the same thing of just creating lots of free content and having some paid stuff and getting most of our users without spending any advertising money, which frankly is not the best idea, right? Like if something works, I should have spent more, but I didn't really know entirely what I was doing and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and so, we have The Hustle, which is the daily email. We have Trends. We used to host conferences. And we also have a podcast that I'm actually the host of um, called My First Million. It gets millions of listens uh, and typically is like a top 10, maybe top 20 podcast in the business category by listenership. But give it one more year. I think it'll be top five soon. Um, and we did the same thing with that. We haven't spent a lick of money. Uh, we haven't spent a dime growing it. But starting next month, we are going to start spending a lot of money to grow it. Um, and so it's a cool business. And what I can talk about, uh, Ryan was saying about how we stand out in, in, in uh, popular categories. And I can tell you, it, it basically all comes down to content. And content is interesting because everyone physically can do it. Everyone here can write sentences on a blog post, but it's really hard to get it right because everything that you're taught in English class in like eighth grade, like you just don't pay attention to that. And that's basically the secret. But, and, and so when we ever, whenever we write blog posts, we've been, you know, we've got blog posts that have been seen 5 million times, 10 million times. Whenever we write blog posts, I always start with distribution first. So I'll try to explain this, but it's basically a, it's basically a circle, a cycle here of how I come up with ideas. But the first part, and, and you, can come, you can start in a different part of the circle, but then you gotta go. So I always start with distribution. So before I even have an article idea, I say, who do I wanna reach and where are they? Then I think, what medium are they going to be coming from? So are they going to be coming from search, from Facebook? Right now, Twitter is having like a resurgence. So if you go after tech people, that's where the, those folks are. If you're going after like nerdy types of folks, which is who I am and where I was going after, they're on Reddit and Hacker News. If you're going after um, fitness people, maybe they're on, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't read a lot of fitness content. Maybe they're on bodybuilding.com. Maybe they're on some fitness subreddit. Just like, where are they going to come from? Then I think, what's the headline? And then finally, and this is where most people start, but this is my last thing most of the time, what's the story? And not only what's the story, but what's the emotion I'm gonna get someone to feel? And sometimes I'll, I'll hear a story like, last year I met this guy, he was wearing a, like a Ramones t-shirt and cowboy boots and he was like really huge. And he starts talking to me about newsletters, and I was like, and he had a super thick southern accent. I'm from Missouri, he was from uh, Missouri as well. And I started talking to him, and he started like saying all the stuff about his subscription. He's like, yeah, we got a pretty good subscription business too. It's just me doing it, we do about 30 million in revenue. And I'm like, what the fuck? 
And I'm like, what? And I, I, I judged him. I judged him hardcore. I'm like, you? He goes, yeah, we, we talk about commodities and a lot of hedge fund people buy it. And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, it's just me and my son. And so, yeah, and I'm like, dude, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Tell me everything. And so that, in that example, I haven't published that much yet, but I've talked about it in the podcast. That started, I started that one with a story because I'm like, oh, I just heard something. I'm going to file that. I know what emotion it just got me. And then, I'm a, and then I would think like, all right, now what's the, he, what's the headline of that going to be and where is this going to get popular? And I constantly think about that, that cycle. Most people, when they do content, they just say like, we need users, write a blog post. Um, fortunately, it's not that simple. Um, and so I can talk today. Uh, I think most of the learning that we'll do is through Q&A, so we'll talk more about it there. Um, but there's this whole cycle uh, that I use for creating content, and we've done it a bunch of times. So we've published many, many, many thousands of blog posts. And the type of stuff that we do, there's a few different types of content that you can do. <coughs> the, stu the, t the type of stuff we do, we aren't optimizing for search. So if you own a, a brand that you're trying to optimize for search, what you're going to do is probably different than what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if I have nothing, I've got no backlinks to my site, so I'm not going to rank really. If I don't have a name, no one knows me. The type of, the type of stuff I'm talking about is the stuff that, that uh, you use what I'm saying. And I actually think that's a benefit overall because it pisses some people off if you do it the right way. But this group, group of people who you want to love you, they're obsessed. They, 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 it's, it's meant, I call it niches make riches. I'm just appealing to this one group of people and I know that I am and I'm going to go super hard on those guys. Um, and it works. So that's how we built the hustle to, you know, millions of daily users. Um, that's how the podcast, it does the same thing. We do the same principles for that. We know that it doesn't appeal to everyone and we work really hard at appealing to a very particular type of person. And we've done that with trends, which is a, an eight figure subscription business. So, that's a little bit about the hustle. Um, I'm happy, uh, Ryan, you want to come up and we could, and we could go through some questions, but um, I wanted to give you guys some context uh, on the business and uh, hopefully that will help you have some good questions later. I think that's where the most, where the best learnings are, but uh, that's kind of the story so far. Give it up for Sam Parr, please. Um, before we go over to q and I, I have a couple questions that came up for me. You, you said something about starting with the distribution, of going to where the people are before you even think of the, the, the content. I was curious how that impacted your approach to the podcast. It makes total sense for like a, a blog, but from the podcast where you're doing a lot of interviews and just talking about what's going on with your own investments, like how does, how does that approach? Yeah, so that? let me explain to you how we do this for a blog. And I'm gonna, there's, there's like, 10, five or 10 different ways you can do it. I'm gonna tell you the easiest way, my favorite way. Does anyone here use Reddit? Does anyone here not know anything about Reddit? Yeah, Reddit's weird. It's like the fifth most popular website in America and yet there's actually a huge amount of people who have no idea what it is. <laughs> it's basically a bunch of subreddits, which are basically forums. Reddit is a, is a list of different types of forums for different interests and people post links and they comment on those links. That's all it is. And so what I like to do, my whole philosophy is I want to know what the people are already talking about, what type of content is trending with my desired audience, and I'm going to figure out a way how to make my version touch on that but be different. Here's the easiest way to do that. Let's say that I'm writing an article about the fitness industry. I'm going to go to Reddit, the, the fitness subreddit, so reddit.com r slash fitness and there's one million members of that community. I'm going to click sort by top posts over the last month. I'm going to get 20 posts and it's going to be people posting a thought, like an idea, like a, just a headline like what's your favorite exercise for hip mobility? Uh, what's your favorite do-it-yourself home equipment? Or I'll see an article of someone posting something and, and so anyway, that I scroll through the first 10 pages and I get the idea of what is popular with this group. And so I can just scroll through that for 10 minutes and I'll understand what it is. Then I pick the one I want. So I just saw a post that's like nine posts down. It's what's your favorite DIY, uh, I'm going to say it, do it yourself, DIY, uh, home equipment. I click comments and I sort comments by most upvoted comments and I see one that says this is great but you forgot about using PVC pipe, which is the most versatile 
pipe, I'm making a lot of this up, so I might get some wrong, <laughs> which is like the most versatile uh, building material, and you could use it to make kettlebells. Here's a picture of me that I made it, uh, a kettlebell, and it's like really highly voted. Um, so in my head, I'm like, boom, people care about do-it-yourself stuff, and this guy just posted this thing about his kettlebell. I should do a whole post on how to build kettlebells using PVC pipe for $8 from Home Depot. And that is an example of how I'll get an idea for a blog post. For um, my first million for the podcast, we do similar types of stuff. So I go to Hacker News and I look at what's trending and then I click the comments and my audience hangs out in Hacker News. So that's why I do it. Hmm. I go to Hacker News, I look at what's trending, I look at the con co comments to get the vibe. Sometimes someone, the article will say one thing, like we think Amazon doing this is a great idea. The top post will be like, I disagree. I think it's a horrible idea. And then people debating that. And so I'm like, okay, I got plenty of, of material here about interesting ideas. Now, what is my opinion of that? And that's what well, a lot of times what we'll do for the podcast. Additionally, um, if we're trying to get big on YouTube, which we're starting next month, I'm gonna use YouTube uh, data to figure out what are people searching for. And I'm gonna be like, do I have a strong opinion or a strong uh, intel on anything that they're searching for? And if yes, that's what I'm gonna start talking about in the podcast. That said, about the other half of the, so that's, we do that for some of the podcast stuff. The other stuff that we do with the podcast is we just say whatever we think is interesting. And that's where like some skill and talent, I mean, I'm pretty good at podcasting. My co-host Sean is like world class. Uh, and so that stuff is like the talent part that it's hard to explain, but that's well, what we what's, do. what's interesting about that is. Does well, anyone listen to the podcast? All right, we got a few listeners. So what's, what's interesting about this is you are basically inserting yourself into the conversation that people are already having. Where they already are. Rather than making one up, which is what most people I'll make one assume, up eventually. But, but you're making one up from like your own perspective on something that people are already talking about. Correct, at least to get started. Right. Then once now, with the hustle, we, you know, we've got two million subscribers, we can, we, just, like, we can write a story about something and we're like, this is kind of bullshit how this is happening. And maybe no one has ever called that out. And then that kind of can create a movement. But in order to get going, I had to tap into what was already happening. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, there, there's actually like some relief in that because of, oftentimes the idea of content creation or audience building is thought of as you making it up or posturing yourself as an authority no, or something. No, I'm living my life and I'm filing stories. So here's an example. Do you guys remember, you may not remember this, Steve Harvey hosted the American yeah. Beauty pageant and he like said the wrong winner. Like he said like, the winner is, and he accidentally read the runner up. Does anyone remember that? Okay, so in a very split second, he goes, look, it's what the card said, and then he turned it. Well, I zoomed in on that card, and everyone was like, Steve Harvey, you idiot. I zoomed in on that card, and like, if you know anything about UX and design, it was horribly designed. I totally understand why he made that mistake. And so that happened on a Monday night. By Tuesday morning, we wrote a post that said like, don't blame Steve Harvey. The design of that card was horrible. Here's actually how it should have looked like if you use proper design principles. And that post ranked the next morning on Google News when everyone was searching. And that got like 500,000 views. And so we just took something that I knew people were gonna be searching for, but I just took a different take on it. So I'm not trying to be better, just different. Yeah, and it, it's, it's really hard to not have an opinion on something and give your commentary on it. And if it is thoughtful, then you insert yourself into the conversation that's already happening without trying to have to invent or posture yourself in order to get attention. Now, Sam, I wanted to ask you, you recently had the exit. You recently were, were acquired. I was curious, being on the other side of that while you were building all of this and now being rewarded for a lot of that, what has happened to your mindset or your approach to business? Has it changed? Has it been a difficult transition? What has that been like? Has anyone read this book? Um, it's, I always am embarrassed talking about it because the title's stupid. How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. Yeah, so I read that book when I was younger and he has some line in that book that says, if I had to do it all over again, I would get rich by the age of 35. And he says, I, I forget exactly what he says, but something like, I would tr I'd want to get $30 million by 35 and then I would just want to coast forever because I dedicated my life to this and I wish I would have had more time to have a family do this, that. I read that when I was like 20 and then I read like this Mark Cuban story about how he sold his business at 32 and then chilled for eight years and then started his next big thing. And I was like, 
I was convinced. I was like, I read this at 20 and I was like, by 30, I want to have a certain amount of money to where I never have to worry again. And then I will figure out what I'll do after that. Maybe I'll do nothing. Maybe I'll do something. I don't know. But I just want like money. I don't want that to be an issue ever again. And we sold right when I turned 31. And so I missed it by a year. But the, yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, but the goal was to hit that. And I'm a big planner. And so we're right on track. And so in terms of mindset, um, it feels, uh, what was the question? What was the, how's, yeah. the mind, how's, how's your mindset changed to the other side of the exit, if at all? Yeah, so I was poor for a long time. I didn't, I grew up poor and I was way too frugal with my business. Um, I should have spent way more money on growth. If you have, look, if you have a machine that turns $1 into $2, what do you do? You load up a dump truck with as much money as you possibly can and you just back it into that machine. I had that machine. And I was still very conservative with how I was spending. I wasn't, if I would hire people, I would hire like a $50,000 employee versus a $120,000 employee who probably would have been more productive. I didn't, wasn't nearly aggressive with ads once I realized the machine's working. I didn't launch stuff fast enough. And I think that really hurt me. And I was doing it from a place of scarcity mindset and from like, there's no way this is, like I had a lot of self-doubt, like there's no way this is gonna work. No way. And now looking back, and I also invest in a lot of companies now, I like see, I'm seeing patterns, I'm like, I should have defaulted to optimism the whole time because it was working. Defaulted and I, to optimism? Yeah, because I, it was working. And I automatically default to paranoia of like, I gotta work really hard to make sure this shit's not broken because it's gonna fucking fail. So I gotta prepare for that to fail and I gotta make sure it won't. And so because I'm already like that, most of the stuff that I'm involved in is pretty solid. So I should have had more optimism and poured more money and resources into things that worked. And that's what I'm learning now that I have I don't have to have that scarcity mindset anymore. So because of your paranoia, you were plugging a lot of holes. Which yeah, actually, I think paranoia is good, gave, Which by actually the way. gave you like the foundation to have the machine that turned $1. Yeah, so paranoia is good, you had right? You flipped over into the optimism earlier. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, so like if you're preparing for a fight in the UFC, like you should in, go to bed every night, this other guy is working harder than me, I gotta work harder, right? That's healthy. But you also have to, it's weird. You gotta have this other side of like, I'm the best, I can do it, this is gonna end well, I'm going to achieve my goal. Mm. And I wish I would have had a little bit more of that confidence early on. But I did the best I could. I mean, I started the company when I was 24. I, I knew nothing about media or, I mean, I didn't know anything about anything. Although most people here probably were in the same boat. But I, I just wish I would have had a little bit more confidence of, of what the business could have become. I think that our, the business style that we had, like I said, we would have done 20, so HubSpot, bought us and we basically shut down our whole ad department. So we went into the year with millions of dollars booked of ads. They go, no, 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 like we make billions of dollars a year. We don't care about this little ad business. We want you because you have all these amazing users and we want them to eventually buy HubSpot. And they're right, that's a smart move. But um, had I continued owning the business, there was definitely a path to make 100 million plus in revenue. Um, and uh, I, sh I, I should have had, a, I should have aggressively I should have known that that was possible because looking back, it is. So was, did that realization come after partnering with HubSpot because you see that what they're really after is the users and they're not looking at it from a profit and loss statement, which means that you, ha you had been looking at it from that perspective, which made you protective. Yes. It, so that aha of saying, oh, this company is more interested in the users that I yeah, have. Yeah, because for me it was easy. Intellectually it was easy. Emotionally it was hard, like going to work every day and like even when things weren't working, like. Like, but intellectually, I'm like, look, I know if I write 10 blog posts, only three or two are gonna work. Like, that's okay. Intellectually, I, I totally understand how to do this. Intellectually, I totally understand how to get loads of users to my website. That's, that's, I don't struggle with that. That's easy for me. Just like maybe for whoever you got, you, whoever's really good at what they do, it's very easy for them to do that. And when someone was like, hey, I'll pay you tens of millions of dollars for all these users, I'm like, what? Just go do it yourself. Uh, I'm like, why are you, what do I, what, what are you doing? Uh, you know what I mean? So once I learned that, yeah, that was part of it. And also, you know, once you have an exit, I'm like, um, um, I now know what's possible and I know the errors that I made and one of those was not going nearly, nearly hard enough. I was very conservative uh, with, with our money. Um, Financially, you were conservative. Yeah, yeah, so like I was famous. People make fun of me. So we had about 35 employees. All of their computers I bought on Facebook Marketplace for $500 a piece. 
We were making like tens of millions of dollars. Why the fuck don't I just go to Apple? Like it would have saved me so much time. And and why do you think that you were so conservative? Because I grew up poor, and yeah. uh, every dollar and that most every dollar in there that was mine. You get an emotional attachment to that of that's my money, not the business's money. Correct, and that's. And, and there's a story about. It's not stupid. That's reasonable, but that's it wasn't unwise. It makes sense. It is certainly not optimal, mm -hmm. <laughs> because because when you have a story about what that money means in the business account, you're not freed up to actually deploy it in the way that you're talking. Yeah. About so we didn't raise venture customers. capital. If I raised venture capital, I would have run the business way differently. I, and it, and uh, tell tell me what you would have done differently had you raised capital. Well, so the thing is is. A lot of people here and a lot of my friends who are speaking, they bought ads early on for their businesses and that worked for them. I think that for a lot of people that doesn't work because you're just kind of filling up a leaky bucket or maybe your product isn't actually that great. And so because we didn't have money, it forced us to make something that people organically liked. And then the ad money that we put on it was a fuel on the fire. It wasn't the, the fire starter. Not, not to say that, that other, I mean, both strategies can work, but for us, we had something that worked. And once I knew it worked, I should have spent way more on uh, advertising. Is it, is it fair to say that, that your product was the content in the newsletter because that's- No, not, no, it's our product was the attention. So mm. most people here have commerce businesses, I would imagine, but media, the, the enterprise value of media is basically equal to uh, the quality of people who you have consuming your stuff um, multiplied by the number of people multiplied by your influence over them. Huh. For example, if you have a blog for 12 year old kids, 12 year old kids don't have a lot of money to spend. So you're going to need like 50 million of them and you're going to need to have a fairly large influence on them. So a lot of them will buy a hoodie from you versus if you have an audience of only 20,000 doctors who run hospitals, that doctor can make a decision to purchase a million dollars worth of equipment. You probably only need, like I said, like 10,000 of them and you need to have like a mild influence over them. And uh, you know, like 10,000 doctors could be you know, more valuable than let's say 30 million 12 um, year olds, something like that. And so with media, you have to look at that equation um, to, 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 to figure things out. It makes sense. So you brought up at the beginning how you were sc scrapping to get an audience and to get attention. To be you were not an expert in the field of going after tech nerds? Well, I had been blogging forever. You had? Yeah, on my own personal blog. So, and I, so prior to... Um, At 24, you were blogging forever? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I had been blogging since I was 18. Okay. Uh, and I had been storytelling for a long time. So prior to starting my business, I actually owned a chain of hot dog stands in Nashville, Tennessee, and it was called Southern Sam's Wieners as Big as a Baby's Arm. <laughs> And, <laughs> and look, I'm selling hot dogs. Like, they pretty much all taste the same, right? Like, if I gave you like five different brands, you, yeah, it's fucking fine. It's just meat. It's fine. So I had to figure out how do I sell this thing. And so that's like it with a. I'm, I'm from Missouri. I'm not really from the South. But I, the shtick. I realized I had to come up with shticks, and I had to learn how to get people's attention. And so I had this like marketing thing that if you put your baby's arm in a bun and put mustard on it, you get, and I let me take a picture, you get a free hot dog. And so, <laughs> and so at a young age, I, I read the book, um, Influence by Robert Cialdini. And I learned early on how to use my voice to influence people to get them to do what I want them to do. And so I would use that to sell hot dogs. And I just kind of, Took, uh, one day I took a course by my friend Neville Medora, who at the time wasn't my friend, I was just a fan of his, and I learned about copywriting. And I was like, man, I'm really good at selling if I just talk to someone. If I learned copywriting, I could like do this like to a, you know, an infinite amount of people. And so that's when I learned how to put that on text uh, and, and be a copywriter. And then once I understood how people thought, copywriting in sales copywriting is basically figuring out what motivates a human being and conveying or creating a solution that makes it easy for them to want to purchase it. And once I figured out how to, people think, then I was like, now how do I get someone to share this blog or share this content? And then I just deployed that on the blog. And I'd been blogging and perfecting this. And in order to learn how to be a great copywriter and be a great blogger, what I, was, I, I spent years doing this, uh, I called it copy hour. So for one to two hours every single day, I would get the best of something. Mm -hmm. So for example, 
I did The Catcher in the Rye. I did Saturday Night Live scripts. I did movie scripts. I did the best sales letters of all time. I did great blog posts. And I would print them out, and word for word, I would copy them by hand. And the reason I did that was if you look at like how we learn how to play guitar or any instrument in America, it's, it's, it's very easy. You can go from knowing nothing to being a pretty good musician in like a year. Um, and the way you do that is you copy other people's songs. So you learn how to play the piano, you learn how to play Jingle Bells, you learn how to play this other thing, then you move on and start learning how to play some like cool rock music that you like and you master that and then you're like, oh, I see all the patterns here, this is amazing. Then you write your own thing. And that's what I did with writing is I just copied other people's work to understand, oh wow, check out this thing that Stephen King always does, I just caught it. And it makes me feel this the way and this way. And then after a while, I was like, all right, now I understand how stories work. I'm going to make my own stories, and I'm going to use all these techniques that I've physically learned by writing them out by hand. I, what I'm curious about in, in those early days at The Hustle is not having any existing influence over tech nerds and getting their attention. It, what's interesting about that is oftentimes people who, are, who model your approach have the assumption that there's some expertise and you're speaking from a place of authority. And you just went in with that, with like, in order, just getting their attention. I, 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 want, yeah. I want to know, going into that, did you know that tech people were your people? Did yeah, you know so that that was the target market? I didn't have authority in that, like, why should my opinion be better than anyone else's? I, I, I couldn't, like, tell you why, other than I thought it was. Uh, which isn't, like, you know, it's an okay reason. But um, I was a tech person. I am a, a business nerd. And so... I said earlier that I was a missionary, not a mercenary, so it's not like, I, like if you were to ask me to start a blog on, um, uh, we have a uh, kettle on fire here, on bone broth. Uh, bone broth is cool, but it doesn't really interest me. Like I would have to go and become an expert, but uh, like I don't really care about that. So I would be a hired gun for that, and you pr I probably wouldn't be as good. With the tech stuff, that was my life. You know, I cared about it, I thought about it constantly. Um, and so, I became an expert probably, I mean, am I an expert? I don't know, but maybe because, yeah, people's perception maybe, but because I kept doing it, but I lived this life. I care about it deeply, I love it. I was blogging about this stuff, and then it just so happened I started making money from it. From it. So um, some of the greatest people who I like in uh, media, Ted Turner, he's obsessed with news. He loves news. Rupert Murdoch, obsessed with news. Rupert er Murdoch owns all these newspapers that don't even make money. And they're like, why do you do that? He goes, I love it. I'm obsessed with it. I can't let this guy go. Like, I, I love this newspaper. Um, and I feel the same way about a lot of media stuff. I'm obsessed with it. it. I'm addicted to it. Media is a really weird thing. There's a reason why rich guys like Benioff and the Facebook guy buy failing newspapers. It's feeds your ego and it feels awesome and uh, hopefully sometimes it makes a profit and so I'm obsessed with media. But it, it's difficult to come into the media game unless you are obsessed with something. And, and, I totally agree, yes. And, and, for, and for most people they are out thinking their interests, like they're trying to target so perfectly that they're not actually following what they're obsessed about enough in order to get the attention. 100%. You have to be obsessed about it. And often, people who own businesses will say, hey, uh, can you teach me how to use content to get users? And I'm like, I can, but I can, knowing what I know about you, it's going to suck because like, <laughs> you're not even connected to this. You really don't give a shit. I don't know how you're going to even, it, like a lot of people want to hire people out right away. I'm like, man, unless you have a voice that comes from the top, it's, it might be challenging. And also, um, you really got to care about this thing because internet people have the greatest bullshit detector there is. And what's the best way to circumvent someone's bullshit detector? You don't bullshit. That's the best way. And so <laughs> it's really, so like people will get into this business and they want to hire like someone on Upwork just to do keyword fillers. And it's like, uh, that's not going to work. Maybe sometimes, occasionally, but typically that's not going to work and you really need to care about it. And I guess the CEO or founder doesn't always have to care about it, but they got to at least know how to find and motivate the people who are passionate about it. So that, that's what I wanted to ask you next because what you're saying makes total sense for a solopreneur or even a solopreneur with an, with an assistant. But when you just try to scale that and build a team of 35 people, like, it is difficult to protect that obsession. So what did it look like for you to go from 
a person who's blogging about things that get attention and then building an infrastructure that is now a media company. Yeah, building a content team is hard and we fire a lot of people. <laughs> So we hire pretty quickly and then we fire them right away if it doesn't work out. And that's a lot in the media, that's kind of normal. And we, when we hire people, we're like, yeah, we're going to give you a chance. Within four weeks, you know, we'll know if this works. And usually they're like, yeah, this doesn't work, you know, when we tell them. So it's not like a, this is like some mean thing. Um, and so uh, we, we, I have an a editor-in-chief, his name's Brad Wolverton. I recruited him from NerdWallet, and before that, he was at the Washington Post. At NerdWallet, he wrote about personal finance, which is related to business, so he really cared. He's an amazing person at managing writers. Managing writers, which I put myself in that category as the writer, it's a huge pain in the ass. Everyone's a diva. The best ones are divas, and you have to put up with it because hmm. what makes them a good coworker um, or sorry, what makes them a good writer and a creative person makes them a shitty coworker and someone who's a pain in the ass. They're like typically always late. They get, they will submit their stuff at the very last minute. They won't know what they're doing on a Wednesday, even though they're going live on a Friday. That is, but that is normal. Those types of people often are very, very good. And so you have to be very patient at managing them. You have to be very patient at saying, what they can and cannot do. So for example, one time Goldman Sachs interviewed uh, or uh, sponsored our newsletter and we did a story on Fuck Jerry. Fuck Jerry is this Instagram handle that has all these followers and he was launching something interesting and so we wrote about it. And uh, one of the writers decided to put um, the word fuck in every sentence. He's like, fuck Jerry launched this thing. It should be pretty fucking good. Like, and Goldman was like, yeah, we're not paying you for that ad. And I went to the writer and I was like, I support that, good job. <laughs> I'm down with that. And so, um, <laughs> like doing things like that, you gotta let creative people create as long as they are hitting, the, 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 as long as they're following most of the rules, hitting the deadlines and hitting their goals. I, I, I teach them how to do it. And besides that, I let them be free. And that's what they like. I saw you tweet out recently that you found a direct correlation between the number of downloads on an episode and the amount of research that you did going into the episode. Yeah. That was like, that was your growth hack, that you could find a direct correlation. There. Yeah, so the Can podcast, that? right now, it's getting like a million listens a month. Um, each episode gets um, like, a low one will be 30,000 downloads an episode, a really high one will be over 100,000 downloads an episode. Is anyone here in the podcast industry? Um, there's a couple people. Podcasts are fucking hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever grown. Um, we're about two years in. I think by year three we'll be, we should be north of 100,000 an episode, which would make us one of the biggest. Um, it's hard. And a lot of people ask how we grow, and I'm like, well, the first two reasons you, you, you maybe can't replicate, and that's that we have the hustle, so we have a lot of people to tell. The second reason is, like I said, I'm good at it. My partner on the podcast, he's like amazing at it. And so we have like talent, um, and, uh, but, but we work really hard at researching. And what we do is we have researchers now who help us. My first million basically, we, um, remember how I told you about that guy who's got that $30 million a year subscription business with two people? I like hear a story like that and then he tells me all of his numbers and, he, and I deconstruct how the business works. And then I tell Sean, I'm like, man, I met this guy, here's how the business works. He goes, that's amazing, it reminds me of this business and he'll explain what that does, and so we're just nerding out and deconstructing different companies. And what we do is we research a ton. So we've got this huge document, I spent an entire day researching a ton, mm. and then we get on the pod, and then we just say, do you wanna talk about that or not? And we'll talk about it, and then that will lead to this, that will lead to this, and that will lead to this, and we jump around. And the reason that works is because I'm obsessed with this industry and business, I'm constantly filing away ideas. So I'm gonna meet someone here, I guarantee it, who's gonna tell me something so fascinating that like I've never, like oh, I own this baby clothes business that sells baby clothes made out of bamboo. We do like 50 million in revenue. I'm like, huh? What? And like, I'm gonna store there's, that. There's a few of those here, yes. Yeah, or something like that. Like, I, I know I'm, someone's gonna tell me something they do, something that's like so interesting. I have no idea how it works. Uh, and I'll file that away. And then we're gonna do research. And then he's gonna say something. And then I'm gonna be like, oh, you know, that reminds me. And that's usually how the podcast works. But we're gonna go to Q&A here in a second. But the, before we do that, you have been very transparent, at least on the podcast, about the downsides of the entire journey too, of the dark times. Yeah. It's easy to look at somebody who, I mean, I know you didn't have your big exit until you were 31, but 
But it's, it's, it's easy to look at someone in your position and, and think life must be easy. You've always had it easy. You cruise to this exit. Must be nice. Now you're going to cruise till you're 40, until you have the next big thing. You seem to have magic on everything you touch. It would be easy to create that narrative. Would you tell us a little bit about the other side of the journey? Yeah, I mean, it's fucking lonely a lot of times. Like, it's, yes, it's, the way that it works, in my experience, is 90% of the time things suck, and 10% of the times things are awesome, but that 10%, they're so awesome that it encourages me to keep going through that 90% of bullshit. Hmm. Can anyone relate to that? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I'm all happy now. You thought it was just you <laughs> this whole time. I'm in Austin. I'm, I'm uh, like, the weather's nice. Of course I'm in a good mood now. I, you know, it's funny. I go to therapy, and I always go up Friday at 3. She's like, well, you seem pretty happy. I'm like, dog, it's 3 o'clock on a Friday. Of course I'm in a good mood. Let's move this shit to Monday. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so you're catching me at a good time. No, I mean, look, it sucked. I, I quit drinking. I had a... I, Definitely had a drinking problem. Yeah, Woo. thank you. Um, I definitely had a drinking problem because I was like, there were so many nights where I'd be laying on the ground talking to my wife. I'm like, this isn't going to work. What did I do? Or most of the problems was this person at work is killing me. Do I have to fire them? Why am I failing them so badly? Do I have to encourage them? What the fuck do I do with this person? I cannot figure this out. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> yes. Most everything was people related, to be honest. Or... Um, when the pandemic hit, like a, like a lot of people, business like boomed, right? But the first three months, I was like, we're done. We're done. This is not going to work ever again. The biz I spent five years or four years on this, and it's going to go to zero. I'm, I'm done. Um, and most of the times, I would, throughout a day, it was like, this fucking sucks. I want to quit. I'm out. I'm never doing this again. And then one hour later, I get a dopamine hit from, because I look at Google <laughs> Analytics and be like, this is the answer. <laughs> and in the back of my head, like the thing, at least in my business, and I bet it is for most business, building to like 100 million in revenue, it's very doable in most industries. And intellectually, you can write down, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And then you just wait like 10 years. So you just do that consistently, eight hours a day, every single day for 10 years. Uh, it's going to require a little bit of luck, that's for sure. But if you, if, like, you can have like, a pretty good outcome if you do that for 10 or 15 years. The issue is like every day, the emotions, of uh, uh, your emotions and handling them. That is, it's a 100% emotional game for me. So I read all this self-help bullshit, which some of it helps, you know, the whole Naval happiness thing. Like I read all that stuff. I meditate every morning. I exercise. Uh, I do all these vitamins. It's pretty much only to do one thing, to control my mood and make it so I can be calm and steady. <laughs> because I know that in the day it's going to be like this, like all this stuff. Like I should be really happy. I should be really sad. My goal is to, to be able to just... Somewhere in between. And so I spend most all of my energy outside of like doing the actual work. I'm making sure that I can keep my mood calm. <laughs> I, think like, I think that's the work. That is the work. I mean, for, for most of us, we know more than we need to know. Yeah, you know, you know plenty. You don't, yes, most people, you know plenty. You know plenty. And, but the, the, also the irony of what you're saying is it was the emotional roller coaster that made you good at media in the first place. Like it's, it's, it's yeah, you know, like your biggest emotion. strength is also your biggest weakness, right? Yeah, like right. I'm, a, I'm, I'm very creative and I'm really good at creating content. It just so happens that that also makes me crazy in other aspects too. You, you do see a lot of deal flow now that you're post-exit because of the podcast. Yeah, and what we have you... like a little mini fund. So I've probably invested 10 or $12 million so far, maybe 40 or 50 different startups. And how do you identify either the entrepreneur or the business that is worthy of your capital? So since selling to HubSpot and even prior to that, you know, I run a media company. I'm a media company, I don't run it anymore, but you... It's cool and that your audience is there, particularly on email. And I, and I kind of forgot to say that basically with our business, email, even now, is like the last channel that you can reasonably own. You don't own Facebook. You know, building a business on Facebook is like building a business on in, a, in an office building and the rent gets jacked up by the landlord every three months. Like there's, you know, they can do whatever they want. I imagine, I don't sell anything on Amazon, but I imagine it's the same. You know, if Amazon says, eh, you know, we kind of feel like doing this, uh, it changes. With, uh, with email, it's really like the last thing that you can own. So our big insight was like, look, if you're looking on your phone, it's a four-inch white screen. Who cares if you click the Mail app or Chrome? 
like, why does it matter? And it just so happens that you can reach way more people with that mail app. And so that's why we did email. Um, and I'm getting it back to your question. What was the question? <laughs> How do you identify the entrepreneurs or the business? Oh, that's what I was happen? saying. Okay. And so the audience is there the whole time, but I got to go out and book these advertisers a lot of times. Uh, and that's a pain in the ass. You know, you got to go uh, kill, kill what you want to eat. So it's like we had salespeople and they had big quotas and it was really stressful. Then we had trends and that was subscription and that was a lot easier. And so I started learning about subscription businesses and everything like that. Then HubSpot bought us and I started looking at their business and I'm like, Oh my God, enterprise software is like so boring, but so lucrative if you can nail a couple things right early on. And it takes a really long time to nail those things, but if you can. And so I love investing in subscription revenue, particularly enterprise businesses. The t the, when we invest, we need things that can get really big. So I try to find things that can, hmm. um, from year one to year two, and then two to three, uh, they need to be, I want them to grow 3x a year for those first two or three years. Um, and if they can do that, then there's definitely potential to break out. Um, so you're basically piecing together what you've seen in your past experiences to be able to identify who's got what it takes to be able to match the criteria. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if I talk to someone, you can kind of figure out, like if they have, I look for grit. So you can kind of figure out a little bit if they have grit. So like, tell me all the projects that you worked on. And if they have like projects that are jumping from thing to thing to thing, I'm like, oh, no, not a chance. I'm out. Um, but typically, if they have one or two that they've stuck with for a long time, I like that. But I like the business. I want, it's, if like a 3x trajectory for the first couple of years is really important because there's a high correlation between that and getting uh, an exit that, that is meaningful. You know, I'm an investor. I own a very, very, very small piece. So that needs to grow. That, it needs to become big in order to make it worth it for me. So I look for 3x. Um, are you, are you comfortable with a high failure rate if you're looking for that amount of growth? Yeah, so uh, the first 20 things I invested in, two inve one, one of them, uh, I turned a $15,000 check into $600,000, and another one I turned 20 grand into uh, 10x, so 200,000. So that's, what's that, 800,000 total? Um, and that pay actually paid, up until that point, I had only invested like 200. Or three hundred thousand dollars of my own money, and so those two out of the twenty paid for, hmm. and that's typically how it works. So, so that gave you a total return of like a four hundred percent, even though the others ended up being nothing. They'll they can be something, but oh, they're still active. They're mean. still active. Got it. They could definitely be something. Um, I want to turn it over to, to the group now. Uh, we don't have a, a mic runner, so just throw up your hand. We do have a mic runner. Ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> Sam Prentice runs our fund. He just bought a microphone company. Hey, Travis. Can you give me morning. water? What's that? Can you ask hey, can, we, can we grab a couple waters, by the way? We'll go right here. And I'm an open book, so you can ask whatever. If I don't feel like telling you the transparent answer, I'll just say I, uh, we don't reveal that. Sam, thanks so much, man. This has been super cool. Um, this is on. You're good. So my question is for the hustle. It sounds like you really focused on creating these like viral content pieces that captured a lot of attention. But how did you think about taking that attention on the blog post and then converting that into an email subscriber? Yeah, so what we did was basically I had this, and I actually tweeted this out. It might be hard to find, so I'll reshare it today. But actually, um, every single day, I had a spreadsheet, and the whole team would meet once a week, but the team was like just three of us for the first year. But basically, I had a spreadsheet and I said, here's how much visitors we had and here's how many people gave us their email and I would track that. And so early on, it was about 3%. So if you go to the hustle.co right now, it's just an email capture page. That's all it is. And then what I did was I was like, all right, everyone's going to come through a side door, meaning a, a blog post that they're going to see on Reddit, Hacker News, Facebook, through a friend, whatever. And once they come to the side door, my goal is to optimize the website. So they give me their email or they go to the home page. And so for us, it was like 3% of people. So what's... Um, the first month we got like, or the first week we got like 10,000 users. So what does that mean? The, um, we must have had, um, what's that, like 500,000, or no, a million, I forget, I can't do, I don't, I don't do public math, but basically <laughs> we, um, we I, I could just calculate, like if I get a million people a month, 3% is 30,000, I can get those email subscribers. And then once I got those email subscribers, I would incentivize those people to share more and we created an ambassador program. So I would send them a free sticker if they referred four people and that kind of created that flywheel. So it was get them through that, uh, go for blog posts, any blog post, to sign up with just a pop-up. And the pop-ups were all really funny. 
So I follow the principle of ADA, attention, interest, desire, action. I did that for, um, I see people writing, so I'll say it again, attention, interest, desire, action. Just a very traditional sales technique. And so my pop-ups followed ADA. And so there's this huge pop-up and it said, oh shit, not another pop-up. And then it said, look, now that I got your attention, you've come to this blog post to read blank. And I would like put the title, but the reality is each day we send out stuff just like this. Enter your email here. If you don't like the email after a week, uh, call me and I put my phone number and I'll Venmo you a dollar. Like I would do stuff like that because like who the hell says that, right? That's so weird. And so I would get so many subscribers doing that, uh, little things like that. And then throughout the years we changed the te techniques. You know, that's just one example of a tactic. The strategy remained the, stay, rem rem remained the same of sticking out, but that's like how I got the first bit. Gotcha. That was, that was going to be my question is like, did you offer a specific incentive topical to the post or did you just say, hey, if you like this, check out our Yeah. Email. So like if a lot, if I looked at my analytics that morning and a lot of people were coming from a subreddit called like Kindles, Kindle, and I, so I knew what post they're on, I'd be like, hey, Reddit Kindle readers. And then I would say what I said before. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, we used WordPress and we would do that all the time. Or another tactic that worked really well is we used WordPress and they have this thing called like an ad inserter. It's like a plugin called ad inserter, but I wouldn't make it look like an ad. I would just make it like, Hey, you got to the bottom of this post. It just looked like the rest of the post. Um, I worked my ass off to entertain you here. If you liked it, enter your email here. It's the best way to help me but I'm actually going to be helping you because you're going to be able to feel the same feeling that you just felt every single morning. And like, I would write things like that and I would insert those onto every single post. So it was always getting traffic or so the posts were always getting traffic through search or whatever. And then they would always read that. And, uh, that just builds up. That just compounds. All right, let's go here to the middle of the room. So yeah. the question is, how does the media background impact the other businesses and investments that yep. Sam is a part of? Yeah, so um, my partner in my fund had a blog called Little Things. Has anyone ever heard of Little Things? So, so it was a, um, a viral website that had 200 million monthly uniques. And uh, mine wasn't that big, but we had a lot. And um, what we're good at is using words, videos, audio, to get people to go from knowing nothing about you to liking you. And that's what we're good at. And a lot of people are really good at coming up with cool products to sell. And they're really bad at knowing this thing. And so whenever I invest in stuff, I think, all right, your product is interesting enough, but how are you going to distribute it? How are you going to get it into the hands of customers? What's the plan? And so I'm always in my head thinking distribution first. And the reason why is I just go through this logical thing of basically like, a good product with bad distribution fails. Not always, but a lot, right? Um, so like, and then, and then you have a bad product with good distribution definitely can win. Like look at Heinz ketchup. Many people will say, well, Heinz ketchup sucks. This other ketchup that's made of this like organic stuff or is like in this, from the small town, that's way better. It's like, well, they're not making any money. Heinz is. Why? Because they're fucking everywhere. The pro so even though this lady has this wonderful ketchup, it's in no stores. It's not going to fail. Now, if you can do a good product with good distribution, that's magic. You know, that's amazing. But I always think in my head, like, does this founder, um, are they, do, have, do they have an idea on how this is actually going to get distributed, whether it's like literally ketchup being distributed into a store or do they have like a, are they a, if they're a SaaS company and their product is $20,000 a year, uh, are they, is someone on their team a really good salesperson who can hire a sales team and like run a sales team or are they a content marketing genius and they're going to, so I just invested in Heat and Shah's company. Heat and Shah is a content marketing pro when it comes to getting small businesses that come to his websites via SEO. Um, and I was like, oh, well, dude, I'm in. Like I already know that you know how to get distribution. If you can have a half good product, you're going to win. So I think about distribution constantly. Let's go to DJ in the back. St. Louis. What's up? I'm from South City, St. Louis. Went to Slough High. How about you? Uh, nice. Uh, what year did you graduate? Uh, 
I graduated in 08, so we missed each other. Put the thing there. What, in, what incentives <laughs> did you have for your ambassador program? Like when you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At first, it ch it's, it's changed throughout the year. At first, we did a bunch of interesting things. Like we would put like a t shirt, like we'll fly you out there. The most, so we, it was like you share it five friends, you get one thing, 10, you get another thing, 100, you get another thing. And we knew that one email subscriber was worth roughly $10 to us. And so we did the math of like, all right, how many do we need in order for us to still be a profitable deal? And so at first, we did all this stuff. The best thing that we did, we just had a really cool sticker and we would design tons of stickers and people would do everything for a sticker. How did you, how did we you tried this one thing where we created a candle called Elon's Musk. <laughs> um, that crushed it. But then, well, you know, that's like breaking rules and so they told us we can't sell Elon's Musk anymore. <laughs> um, but a really, really cool and funny sticker crushed it. Oh, and by the way, with the thing, with the, the, the ambassador program, the way it works is most everyone who wants to do it, we'll get to that first level of four. And very few people, only a couple, will get to that thousand. But the ones who get to the thousand will almost like get you as many people as that one. And so we had a crazy good thing here, which is like we're gonna buy you a Tesla or something like that. And those people would get like 30,000 email subscribers. Cool, and then the last question is, so you said your email rate was 45%? Unique open rate, yeah, much how, higher, 65% total open rate. What was like the biggest, that's a really high number, but what was the biggest? It's like the highest I've heard of, yeah. Yeah. What, what, how, how why? Yeah. So we started sending once a week, and then we started sending twice a week, then we started sending three days a week, and then we're like, fuck it, let's just do six days a week. The more we send, the higher the open rate went up. Huh. Yeah, keep in mind, so when we started, it was like 28 when I sent once a week. Then I was like, well, let's do Monday, Wednesday. And then I was like, well, let's do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I was like, oh, let's just, so that was counterintuitive. And so um, we send six days a week. Um, first of all, our product is daily news. So that's habit creating. But with, if you own, uh, what's the most common niche here? Fitness? We'll just say health. Health. Yeah. With a lot of health stuff, you definitely can do just a, an email that's a roundup. Here's all the latest and greatest health related. Like here's the 10 bullet points of what happened in, in the health world today or whatever. Like you could totally do that. And the reason our open rate's really high is because um, it was something that you, it was a habit forming thing that you needed every day. And by the way, if someone signs up to us, we, could, we, have, we, we call it gold, uh, silver, bronze, and then we have copper, which I don't know if copper's less than any of those, but that's what we do. Uh, and we know that like a gold person will stay with us for like three years. And we know where those people are, and then we, and we know what type of content they like. Like we've studied this a lot. And so anyway, the open rate, the reason it works is a couple things. One. It's daily, and they pro it provides information that someone relies on every day. So if you're gonna create like a health thing, just put like, do like literally the utility stuff of like what, um, like here's the health roundup that you need to know. The second thing, do cute stuff, like um, um, riding from my couch with my cat, Whiskers, who I told you about yesterday, he's finally over his flu, let's get to the stuff. Like, like just doing like little like, cute updates like that. And then third, like you can add in like the weather, just anything that gets you to rely on it and want to, and so we would do like, like um, tomorrow I'm gonna be in, in, in New York to meet with one of our biggest customers. I'll let you know how it goes. That's a cliffhanger so I can get you to come back tomorrow. So we got the news that's gonna get you and then I would add in all these other things. Um, second, use a dedicated IP address. So MailChimp has a shared IP address. It's not horrible because MailChimp is reputable and they kick off spammers, but you're ultimately sharing your IP address with a lot of people. Uh, when you get big enough, like 10,000, maybe 50,000 people, spend more money and get a dedicated IP address. Basically, if you don't know what that means, which I, I'm not a tech guy, but uh, what it means is Gmail, Microsoft, and all these companies, they, they look at who the IP address is coming from, and if it's someone that has a history of spam, they send you to the spam box. If you have your own IP address and you have a really high reputation, we don't spam. You have to sign up in order to get our stuff. They know that we have a high open rate. So like it's like this weird thing where you have like a relationship with them. Uh, that helps. The third thing is so you be consistent. Send at the same time all the time and don't miss. Um, what else? Uh, so have a dedicated email. Uh, there's services um, that you can whitelist. So, uh, 
uh, what's it called? I forget what, exactly what it's called. But look up like email whitelist services, and basically it's called a return return path. Is it return path? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Is it return path? Well, yeah. What did they change it to? Yeah, like a few months ago. So it's called, it used to be called return path. We paid them forty thousand dollars a year. It sounds like a scam when they explain what they do. It's not. Uh, but basically, they talk to the email service providers on your behalf, and they say, these guys followed all the rules. There's also a service called Litmus, and you send your email the day before, or right before you send it, through Litmus, and it'll say, here's everything that's going to trigger someone's inbox. Your photo doesn't have a tag. You've used the word free porn. Like, if some, like sometimes we'll write about, like, uh, we'll write about, like, uh, Pornhub making something. Like, they decided to make free porn. I don't know. And like, and so like, whenever we write those stories, we gotta like make sure like, all right, we gotta like make sure we use words that wouldn't be like a scam. You know what I mean? Or like, if we're talking about money, we gotta make sure that we. And so we'll put it through litmus. Um, I think that's it. Oh, and well, obviously, you know, the first most important thing, fucking good content. So get that. Now let's do one more. Tomer. Yeah. No. Just keep going, Tomer. No worries. Uh, I want to touch back on distribution and how you think about, or how the actual process is. Even if you create something that is, even if you create something that is very good, how does it actually get to those places, right? So you create that thing, but for somebody who's a little bit newer, how would it actually get to, you know, Men's Health or whatever it is, so that those people actually hear it? Uh, well, I, d I would never start with Men's Health. That's not what I meant. Thank you. I, yeah, but it's important. Yeah, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm going to make an example out of it. Um, Thank you. The, re the, the reason being is men's health editors, I'm in the media industry and I know all these people who are writing. They get all their shit from Reddit or from like Twitter. Uh, and so then I'm just going to go there first. Um, and so what I mean is I like Reddit. Reddit my, is my preferred place. But right now Facebook groups are probably the second best at the moment. Um, and so what I do is, let's say that I, what's your business? Uh, home office accessories. Home office accessories, that's great. There's a whole subreddit on that. And I will contribute there. I'll take cool pictures of myself with my new desk, and I'll be like, just got this thing, I think it's pretty cool, ask me any questions about how it works, or here's my review of this chair, or whatever. Uh, and then I would post 10 times good shit that does not promote anything that I'm a part of, or at least I'm not selling anything. And on the 11th post, I would say, I've been following here for a long time. Um, I run one of these companies. I think Reddit's amazing. I'm actually get, doing a deal where sub, these people can buy something from us for a discount. Or you'll say, I've been reading this subreddit for a long time, um, and I actually noticed something that everyone here is doing wrong. And it's that one thing is very simple. I'm making this up. You're, Elbows are in a horrible place in your desk. I wrote a blog post that explains exactly why that's true and how you can fix it. And so if you do a bunch of posts organically and provide value, I don't remember, I said about the bullshit thing, I don't bullshit. So I provide value a ton, then I'm gonna do my thing. And you could do that in a lot of Facebook groups as well. Um, I would also, you could do it on Twitter as well, I imagine. And then after uh, I post it all there, then I would probably email like the men's health, stuff like that. But I would think about, in my head, I think, where is this going to get popular first? And then I'm already putting in the pre-work to make it so I, I, I can post in those places and get traction. And then leading them to your site from there uh, with your like, hand, and I wrote about this here, et cetera? Yeah, and then I would put, and by the way, you don't want to click on my site? That's fine. I just copy and pasted it here. You know, I just wrote the whole article here. I do that a ton. And then be like, but if you do want to read it, the link's down here. It always gets tons of clicks. Thank you. Sam Parr, thank you for being here. Anything? Go ahead. Are we, is, is there, and we're doing questions after this somewhere? No, this is it. Oh, These okay. are the questions right now. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be hanging out. <laughs> so I know a lot of other. One thing, I, one thing I want to ask, is there anything that the group did not ask you that they should have? How to hire writers. That's very hard. It's very hard. Um, and the answer is basically right now I just uh, troll Twitter and I troll LinkedIn and I troll publications that I love. And I usually send someone an email and I say, or a DM and be like, you wrote this article, I love it, 
Uh, and that's all I say. Three weeks later, I follow up. It's like, hey, look, I've got this thing going. It's not nearly as prestigious as where you are now, but it's pretty exciting for this reason, this reason, this reason. I've been obsessed with you since this article that I mentioned. Let's talk. Worst case scenario, you've got a new friend in the industry. Best case scenario, you're going to join us and it's going to change both of our lives. Are you interested? And I usually, I'll do that constantly. Pretty cool. One more time for Sam Parr, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're we're going to go to